नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय जय जय श्री चैतन्य जय नित्यानंद जय अद्वैत चंद्र जय गौर भक्त वृंद श्री चैतन्य चरित्रमृत ऑफ कृष्ण दास कविराज गोस्वामी आदि लीला chapter 17 text 168 translation and commentary by his divine grace ac bhakti vedanta swami prabhu pad shuni shuni stabdha stabdha hoilo hoilo kaji kaji nahi nahi sphure sphure bani bani bicharia bicharia kahe kaji kaji parabhava parabhava mani mani shuni stabdha hoye lo kaji nahi spure spure bani bicharia kahe kaji parab विचारी वाणी वाणी ladies please Shuni, Shuni, by hearing, by hearing. Stabda, Stabda, stunned, stunned. Hoilo, Hoilo, became, became. Kaji, Kaji, the Kazi, the Kazi. Yes, 
Krishna Mada Zandha. Nahi does not. Shvure Atta. Bani words. Vicharya after due consideration. Kohe said. Kaji the Kazi. Parabhava defeat. Mani, Mani accepting. accepting. <clears throat> Before I give the translation, I'll just give briefly the context. Uh, <clears throat> Chaitanya Mahaprabhu discussing, at that time known as Nimai Pandit, discussing with, uh, also known as Gaur Hari, as the Kazi will call him Gaur Hari, <clears throat> discussing with Chan Molana Kazi, who has stopped the Sankirtan movement or attempted to stop the Sankirtan movement inaugurated by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in Navadvip. So there's a discussion between them upon the scriptures <clears throat> in which both the uh, Vedic sources and the Quran are discussed, and now you'll find by the translation how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has won the, won the argument. So the translation of this verse. After hearing these statements by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the Kazi, his arguments stunned, could not put forward any more words. In other words, he became speechless. Couldn't say anything more. Thus, after due consideration, the Kazi accepted defeat and spoke as follows. Well, you won't find out what he spoke as follows unless you read it, but I'm just going to read the purport of this verse now. Srila Prabhupada writes, In our practical preaching, we meet many Christians who talk about statements of the Bible. When we question whether God is limited or unlimited, Christian priests say that God is unlimited. But when we question why the unlimited God should have only one son and not unlimited sons, they are unable to answer. Similarly, from a scientific point of view, the answers of the Old Testament, New Testament and Quran too many questions have changed. But a Shastra cannot change at a person's whim. All Shastras must be free from the four defects of human nature. The statements of Shastras must be correct for all time. Om Jnana Timirandhasya Jnana Shalakaya Chakshurin Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Nama Shrishtam Manamapi Shatsiputra Matra Swarupam Rupam Tasyagraja Murupurim Maturim Goshtavatim Radha Kundam Girivaramaho Radhika Madhavasham Prapto Yasya Pratita Kripaya Shridurum Tam Natosmi Dandeham Shri Guru Shri Ataf Padakamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavams Cha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sagarna Raghunatan Vitantam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadhutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sagarna Lalita Shri Vishakhan Vitams Cha Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Uh, Srila Prabhupada writes here, the Shastra cannot change at a person's whim. From a scientific point of view, the answers of the Old Testament, New Testament, and Quran to many questions have changed. Uh, that suggests that the, the teachings which are 
supposed to be based in the Old Testament, New Testament, and Quran, have changed. <coughs> um, rather than the scriptures, it, well, let's put it this way. The, the teachings which are attributed to these scriptures, they have changed more than the scriptures have changed. An example of this is that, uh, I believe it was uh, toward the late end of the 19th century, early 20th century then, in the Western world, artificial contraception was introduced and Christians were very much against it, all of them, pretty much. And then some of them said, well, it's okay. And then now we have Christians preaching that you have to do it. So I went from, it's all, their teaching are based, supposed to be based on the Bible, but it, it changes according to people's whims. <coughs> of course, there are different Christian groups and different Islamic groups and they have their own different interpretations. Up to the present day, the Roman Catholic Church, which is the largest Christian denomination, it, uh, they're against contraception, artificial contraception. <coughs> Although they may change the scripture itself, tell them to go for the, if they need to go for the, yeah, for the translation. Mm. <clears throat> I just received news that the Swedish church, I guess that's the main Swedish church, Lutheran church, I believe it is. You wouldn't even know, you don't need to know what it is. Well, maybe you do, because there, there are Lutheran churches in India also. <laughs> um, in Sweden, the, the, the head bishop is a female, and she has declared on, in, a, in a council, a GPC meeting of the church, something like that, that uh, you should no longer refer to God as He because she is at least as important as He. So you have to say the force or something like that. But you can't, you can't say He. And gradually within a few years it'll become She, probably. Well, in Hinduism, you have it. You can choose male gods or goddesses. Uh, some people say Shakti. In, here in Tamil Nadu, it's the, the Shakti season, isn't it? It's the uh, because they wouldn't allow them at at the Sabarima Sabarimalai, so they started their own thing, Om Shakti. <coughs> yeah, and of course. In, well, that's maybe probably the most distinguishing feature of Hinduism. Is whereas in Christianity there are so many sects, and in Islam there are so many, well, two major divisions and then others. But Hinduism is Jato Mat Tato Pat. As many opinions, that many paths. Therefore, we say we're not Hindu. But the point is, yeah, Srila Prabhupada says it should be scientific. You can't change it according to whim. I'm speaking on this today because tomorrow is Christmas Day, which is celebrated as the birthday of Jesus. There's approximately one in 365 chance that it is the birthday of Jesus because they don't really know which day he was born on. I say approximately because it's closer to 365 and a quarter. <laughs> I'm going to be scientific here, right? There's even not, a quarter is not exactly correct either. But, uh, uh, and Christianity is having its influence 
in this part of the world increasingly. It hasn't come to Salem City much yet as in other places, uh, but it's definitely there. And although Srila Prabhupada said in one letter that it is better not to discuss in any detail about the Christian religion or any other religion, we should have some knowledge of that. Um, because people will ask us, uh, it's good to have some knowledge. And especially those who are specifically preachers, it's good if they have some background knowledge because you may be asked some questions just like a few years ago uh, after the Rathiatra festival in New York City, I happened to be there, and uh, a member of the public at the questions and answers booth asked me, well, what do you make of the saying from the Bible that Jesus says, I am the, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Lord except through me? <laughs> she was asking, not in a challenging mood, but well, what do you make of it? How can, how can you do anything else? That was that was the question. And then I said that they talked about the synoptic gospels, which means uh, <coughs> Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which were written first, and they're all, they all more or less say the same thing. And then this saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life, comes from the Gospel of St. John, which was written at last and has lots of things in it which are not uh, <coughs> in the synoptic gospels, which gives a suggestion that. <laughs> Uh, they may be made up, I didn't say that, um, to the lady who asked. And then I said that, uh, of course, Jesus is presumed to have mostly spoken in a language called Aramaic. That language is still used, although 2,000 years ago it would have been different to the way it's spoken now in many ways. Old, ancient Aramaic. And the Bibles were written in Greek, and the uh, grammatical construction of that sentence in Greek suggests that that statement refers to that particular time and place. That, uh, that uh, it may have been true in that place, that time and place. Just like in New York City in 1966, Srila Prabhupada was the only way to go to God. Or to, or to Krishna, we can say. You may say that Christianity, they could have gone through Christianity or Judaism or whatever. So that would be true, but now by Srila Prabhupada's preaching, there are so many uh, preachers of Krishna consciousness who, by whose association people can go to Krishna. And of course, we all go through Srila Prabhupada and God-brothers of Srila Prabhupada and he goes through Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur and so on. <clears throat> so, because I had a little extra or background knowledge, they were very satisfied with that answer. So it's not that we all have to become uh, experts, but some background knowledge should be there. Uh, one point which is <coughs> very appropriate for the uh, project here in Salem, Iskon Salem, is that <coughs> Christianity has produced a tremendous culture of beautiful and very impressive buildings and uh, paintings. If you go to Italy, it's, it's, Italy is like one big architectural museum and stained glass window. Beautiful, beautiful buildings, churches and cathedrals and uh, in music and they have festivals. Uh, so it's uh, very appreciable cultural contribution in some senses. 
in many senses. Um, and a, appropriate to Salem that we're also making a, a big temple here. So that's for the glory of Krishna and that just to the side, the servants who will serve in that temple, living very simply. No electricity, very simple dwellings. So that will both have their uh, utilization or in preaching. Big temple. Oh, it must be it must be something very important to build a big building, uh, and with so much carvings, uh, must be something very important. Krishna consciousness must be very important. Big buildings have their uh, util, util their, their uh, use in this regard. Uh, but then if they see that there's so much money and effort is being made to build such a big building and to perform all the services, and then at the side, the servants are living very simply, that's also a big preaching. <laughs> that all the effort is for Krishna's pleasure, for glorification of Krishna. And that those who are devoted to him, they don't want anything for themselves. So that it, the building big buildings like this, even without saying a word, it's one kind of preaching. Of course, we should speak also. Otherwise, people may just come and look, like in Italy. <laughs> so many people go to look at the beautiful buildings, but if there's no one there to teach them, then uh, <laughs> it'll just be an architectural show. Interestingly, the greatest saint in Italy, maybe the greatest saint in the history of Christianity, St. Francis of Assisi, he uh, not exactly rebelled, but he took a different course against the institutionalization and the, the pomp and the majesty of the church. And he lived very simply. And he said, don't make big buildings in my name, which they started to do even in his own lifetime. <laughs> so for preaching, we need big, big show to attract people, especially in this Kali Yoga. People are very much on the sensual platform. <laughs> but the devotees themselves, they should be models of Vairagya Vidya, Vairagya Vidya, Nija Bhakti Yogam, Shikshartha Meka Purusha Purana, Shri Krishna Chaitanya Shri Radhari, Kripa Ambate Yastamaham Patanje, Sarva Bhoma Bhattacharya, praised Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that he came to teach bhakti devotion to himself, to Krishna, but he's Krishna, which is based on vairagya and vidya, uh, detachment and knowledge. And of course, Sarvabhuma, he was, uh, although a householder, he was acting as the guru of so many sannyasis because he was highly learned. And Mayavadi sannyasis, they pride themselves on vairagya and vidya, but he saw that was practically manifested in Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teachings. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu accepted this, um, or he came as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to preach devotion to himself, uh, in which there is uh, spontaneously Vasudeva Bhagavati Bhakti Yoga uh, Bhakti Yoga Adhokshish. I'm getting mixed up. Vasudeva Bhakti Bhagavati Bhakti Yoga Prayojata Janyatya Shuvai Ragyam Gyanam Charyada Hai to come. This, uh, for one who is absorbed in Krishna consciousness, uh, then automatically knowledge and renunciation manifest within him. Uh, so Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, being an ocean of mercy, he came to teach that in the Kali Yuga. <coughs> uh, Christ himself is very simple and austere. 
while teaching to love God. He didn't uh, reject that there was a big temple. Uh, he didn't. He also went to the temple. There was a big Jew, Jewish temple there. But he did protest against the uh, commercialism that was going on there. So, uh, Jesus, of course, was a Jew, born in a Jewish family, and Judaism was and is the religion of the Jewish people. <laughs> and uh, in that way, we can understand that uh, it, its limitation. Teachings of Krishna in Bhagavad Gita begin with teaching us that we are not the body and we get body after body. But if you say this, our God is for our people, and that's immediately identification with the body. <coughs> Christianity grew out of Judaism. Although the history is difficult to put together exactly because 2,000 years ago and uh, we're not even sure what's going on in the world today exactly with all this talk of fake news. So 2,000 years ago what exactly happened we don't know. And even someone may report on something but they have their own perspective also. Someone may report on Jesus and say what a great person he was and someone else may report on him or anyone else and say what a bad person he was. <coughs> but anyway, Christianity, it grew up. Uh, Jesus, his teachings uh, recorded. <coughs> he mostly taught very simply, mostly in parables. It's, uh, you have a word for parable in Tamil? Uh, it's by analogies, you can say. <clears throat> Many of them are very good also, just like uh, <clears throat> a man goes away and he leaves some money with different sons and he comes back after some time and he finds that one son has invested the money and done some business and made more money, he's very pleased with them. Someone just kept it and the other one lost it. Something like that, I can't remember. So that's, the example is you're given something by God and you should use it in his service. That's what we can get from them. Or, anyway, there are so many of his parables. So he taught in a very simple terms. Of course, so <coughs> The Vedic literature is full of such analogies and examples also, just like the rope, the, the rope and the snake, the frog in the well, and so many others like that. But Srila Prabhupada, he, uh, he also gave many such analogies, and it does help us to make things clear. Jesus uh, spoke. <coughs> There was, a lot of it was recorded, that's the, <coughs> has come down as uh, the New Testament. Um, but what we have as Christianity today is largely based, uh, or the, the essence of it is not based on what Jesus himself taught. It's based on what St. Paul taught. St. <coughs> Paul never actually met Jesus. Uh, he was persecuting the Christians when he had some revelation and he became a Christian. And he made up the idea that Jesus is God, the only Son of God, and that you can only get delivered by having faith in the idea that he died on the cross to purge us of all our sins. So this is the essence of Christianity as we know it today. But it's not what Christ taught, or not what the early followers believed. <coughs> so let's not do that with Srila Prabhupada also, and just completely reinterpret. It's quite possible uh, <coughs> to do that. 
The name Christ, <clears throat> it's more like a title. Jesus was the name. Yeah. And there, there, it seems there were many people called Jesus at that time. <clears throat> so he was known as Jesus of Nazareth because his father was from Nazareth, which is still there. It's a pilgrimage place for Christians. I believe it's in Syria and the present time in that country called Syria. <coughs> and uh, yeah, just like in, uh, in Tamil Nadu, how many men and boys are called Sintim? Quite a, probably a few lakhs, right? So there's probably a few, at least two or three right here now. I wouldn't be surprised. So to distinguish, he was called Jesus of Nazareth. Of course, if he was in Nazareth, that wouldn't be very helpful. <clears throat> but when he came out, he was known as Jesus of Nazareth. <clears throat> Christ means the anointed one. It means someone who they've been uh, given a mark or anointed with oil. It means it's, a, it's a, supposed to be a, a symbol of giving respect. <clears throat> it was believed at that time, it's still believed by the Jews, that a Messiah will come. A Messiah is someone who comes sent by God and delivers the Jewish people from their suffering and that's the end of the world and all the Jews go to God and, and I'm not sure what happens to the rest of them according to the Jews. Uh, and it was believed at the time that the Messiah was going to come very soon to rid them from the uh, bondage of the Romans. They were under Roman rule at that time. So it's believed that any time the Messiah is going to come and he'll be the king of the Jews and will drive out the Romans and then the Jews will live happily ever after. Something like that. They'll have a Jewish golden age. And they thought that the world would, uh, others thought the world is coming to an end it's so bad with the Romans oppressing us like this. So in this way, uh, they were waiting for their savior. And that's still going on today in Christianity with the idea of the second coming of Jesus, which I've been hearing about practically since the time I was able to understand language. <laughs> Not that I was taught it in the Catholic tradition that I was raised in, but there's a, Jesus is coming. It's two years from now, one year from now, six months from now, one month from now, one week from now, and then the day goes, and the day goes on as usual, and then they recalculate, and it's going on like this for the last 2,000 years or so. It's been going on like this. So uh, many people recognize that Jesus was uh, an empowered uh, or powerful, let's use the word powerful, uh, uh, a preacher of God consciousness, and certainly was. Srila Prabhupada always speaks with great respect about Jesus. Uh, they thought he's the one, he's the one who's going to save us. But after his crucifixion, they were disappointed. Interestingly, as a side note, in Islam, they also recognize Jesus as a prophet, but they don't believe he was crucified. They think that's just some trick that God made to mislead people. Something like that. <laughs> so, uh, his followers, they went into hiding even just before his uh, crucifixion. Actually, in, in the 
in the Bible, they make a very big thing about his crucifixion. They have a, in all the four Gospels, there's a long description of all the events leading up to it. They really make a big thing. But as Srila Prabhupada pointed out, well, what are his teachings? What are his teachings about God? That's the main thing. The, the drama. It is highly dramatic how he was, uh, <coughs> he was betrayed by one of his twelve intimate followers <coughs> who felt so bad about it that he went and hung, hung himself and committed suicide right afterwards. <coughs> so he didn't feel very Judas, he didn't feel very good about that. Uh, <coughs> And it's a big drama how uh, his closest disciple, Jesus said the night before, the last supper, they all had together. He said that, uh, Jesus said to Peter that uh, three times before the cock crows, you will uh, deny me. And Peter said, what are you talking about? Because they didn't know what was going to happen the next day. So three times when Jesus was arrested and then he was brought to public trial and then an immediate death sentence and whipped and carrying a cross and crucified. Three times Peter was there in the crowd and people said to him, oh, you were with him? What? No. Because <laughs> he didn't want to get uh, treated the same way. And the third time he said it, the cock crowed. Oh, he thought. So it's a very dramatic and heart-rending uh, narration and in Europe for many, many years they used to have just before uh, Easter, which is the celebration of Jesus rising from the dead, they used to have passion plays and they still go on in some places. In the Philippines they, they, they have a whole reenactment of the crucifixion and they even nail someone to a cross with big nails. <clears throat> so I, just like here you have the Thai pusam and people they put the, put the big stakes in their mouth and no blood comes uh, by the blessing of Murugan, I guess. That's what it's said to be. And it is remarkable. Isn't it? They get, they get hooks put in their back and they drag, they drag the chariot and no blood comes, they don't feel any pain. And they walk through the fire and so many things. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, there's been a lot of historical research done on Jesus. Of course, some people don't believe in that. Uh, they only accept what's in the Bible. Of course, what exactly is the Bible? That was, there are different Bibles with different books, but most of the Bibles have the same books. Uh, there are different churches which follow different books. And the early Christian church, they debated whether or not we're going to keep the, what they call the Old Testament, which is more or less equivalent to the Hebrew Bible that the Jews follow. The Jews don't follow the New Testament. New Testament is about Jesus and his followers. They almost didn't put it in. And probably it would have been better if they didn't because the Old Testament is... Uh, well, it's, uh, God doesn't come off as a very nice guy in the Old Testament. Uh, Jesus, what he taught, uh, was overall seems to be much better. Anyway, these are all subjective opinions. Uh, there is a lot of historical evidence or pointing to what Jesus did in between the ages of 12 and 30 about which there is absolutely not one single word in the Bible that he came to India and uh, then he went back and started preaching. And uh, some, uh, they say that after he, after he rose from the dead, as it said he rose from the dead, Srila Prabhupada said that he never died because he's a yogi 
and you can't kill a yogi. So he just kept his life suspended. And then he came back again. <clears throat> that was Srila Prabhupada's suggestion. So, uh, yeah, some say that uh, he lived in Kashmir after this for many years, and there's a tomb there of Isha. They call him Isha. In, in Islam, they refer to him as Isha. And there's one sect of Muslims, what are they, Ahmedi, I think, yeah, they, they, they make a big thing out of this. They're, they're into, they're Muslims, but they're into Jesus a lot also. That's quite a big sect, by the way, here in India and in other places. So, uh, yeah, it was exactly what's going on, we don't know. There are many ideas and people can dream up all kinds of things. Just like about Krishna, some people say, oh, not devotees, they don't say that. He was a tribal god who was later equated with the Vishnu of the Vedas. And they make up so many ideas. So we don't know. It. There are so many theories about Jesus. Uh, there was in the Bible, it's described how Mary Magdalene was a prostitute who was purified and converted by Jesus. And some say he actually he was married to her. There are all kinds of things. One theory is that he's a homosexual. All kinds of things. You don't know what's going on if you get into listening to so many people. Some say that Jesus didn't exist at all. It's just made up, although most scholars don't accept that, but there is some kind of argument that can be made. Because apparently in the Roman records, or, or the historical records at that time, there's no mention of any such person. And it's said that if there had been such a person, surely he would have turned up in the history. So the, anyway, uh, there are so many ideas floated. Uh, what we, if we take it from the New Testament itself, it seems that the, uh, well, Pontius Pilate, who was the governor of that area at that time, Palestine, uh, is, um, he didn't want to, be, it was the Jews themselves who got Jesus killed because some of them didn't, he was too critical of the Orthodox Jews. They're, they're, they're just in it for the money, they're taking a big position and exploiting others. He, he prote Jesus protested against the, what we are nowadays call the institutionalization of the Jewish religion. And so naturally they didn't like him. We're, people respect us and we're learned scholars and who are they to say all these things? The Pharisees come under a lot of uh, attack by Jesus, the, the, the high priests of the church, and then the Sadducees and others like this. So uh, they made a plot, it seems, and turned the people against him so that they demanded that Jesus be killed, be executed by, by the Roman government. They didn't, for some reason or other, they didn't want to kill him themselves. They could have just had a riot and killed him themselves, but they didn't, they had it done through the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, who didn't want to do it, but under pressure from the crowd, he did so, and then in front of everyone, he washed his hands and said, I don't take responsibility for this. He had to give the order, but he said, I'm not. So, in English, up to the present day, there's a saying, to wash your hands of something. It means you do something, but you don't take the blame. That comes from that. Just like you say, smoking ganja through someone else's hand. <laughs> That's the Indian equivalent. You do it, but you shift the blame on someone else. But then others say that actually the Romans, they wanted to, they were happy that he was executed because anyway, it was be, he was becoming a law and order problem. They want to keep things under control. 
And the, the idea that they, they're always afraid as the conquerors of any country are, they're always afraid that the local people will rise up in rebellion against them, just like the, when the British were in India. They're always afraid that the Indians who much overwhelm them numerically would rise up and then they wouldn't be able to maintain their role. So again, there are so many different uh, ideas coming out from uh, about Jesus. Anyway, may be true, may not be true, but definitely some details, but definitely uh, Christ was a, uh, from our perspective, of course they'll say he's God himself, but they say he's, exactly what that means, that he's God, there are different theories about that also, that he's absolutely non-different from the Father, or that he has his human side and his non-human side, and that, that's the, uh, what are they called? Like something in vain, I can't remember. A nice, no, anyway. Uh, and so there are different theories about the nature of Jesus. Is he God or not God? Uh, mostly they accept him as God. Or the, uh, but anyway, uh, he, by his influence, um, God consciousness uh, uh, became widely spread. In the, his teachings became widely spread. Uh, that he is God himself is, we don't accept. And many Hindus will accept that he's God, but then they accept practically anything as God. So it doesn't, mean, it doesn't really mean anything to say he's God. <laughs> and Muslims are very much this idea, against this idea that it's one of the core tenets of Islam. Illa Allah wa illa Allah. There's only, only God is Allah. Because there are so many gods around at the time of Muhammad. And he, the only real God is Allah. So to say that Jesus is God is considered by them a uh, great heresy. Uh, regarding the teachings of Christianity, yeah, I, the, the main, the central teaching is given by Paul, not by Jesus. And uh, Jesus himself, he didn't give a lot of philosophy. He was speaking to very simple people in a, in a culture that was highly religious, but uh, it, it seems not with a very highly developed uh, sense of philosophy, what we would call tatvagyan. So he spoke very simply. He's recorded as saying, there are many things I have to tell you, but you are not ready to hear them. And a lot of the philosophy got added later, with the, the, the philosophical teachings of Christianity. About 400 years later, uh, Augustine, Saint Augustine, one of the uh, most influential figures in Western civilization because he gave a philosophical basis to Christianity. And that continues to influence Western culture up to the present day. Just like, for instance, um, science became separated to a large extent, from religion in the Western world. But the concept of time handed down in Christianity, and that's one of the topics that Augustine uh, dealt with, is that time is linear. Uh, that there's a beginning and an end. Whereas the Vedic conception is that it's cyclic. That they can't even imagine that. <laughs> So uh, that's just one example. And it very much affects the whole way we see the world. If we see, as in uh, Christianity is taught that you have one life and you either use it to, you either be a Christian and you, actually they don't say Christian, you have to be a Catholic or a Protestant and a particular, you have to be in this particular church, then you'll go to heaven. Otherwise you go to hell forever. 
So the idea that we're just in one lifetime and in many, many, many lifetimes, it's a completely different way of looking at the world. If you think this is it now, and then it's finished, it's a very, very different way of perceiving one's own existence and that of everything else around us and understanding that we're just in one body, we've been in so many bodies and everything is bhutva bhutva praliyate everything becomes man and manifests and then again and again everything is destroyed and it goes on like this it's a very different way of looking at the world and now even though much of what was formerly called Christendom that means the area in which Christianity was prominent which basically was Europe and then it went to the Americas and gradually uh, around the world but uh, <clears throat> what in uh, or among Christians? Yeah, the the idea that is only one life. So when they most of Christendom or the areas that used to be fully Christian after they'd wiped out all the pagans, which were more or less you could say Hindus, uh, they uh, yeah the pre pre Christian culture which was stamped out by the Christian. I mean just literally, they, they killed people who didn't convert to Christianity. It was, like, it was very similar to what nowadays we call Hinduism. Um, so yeah, most of the, the majority, it seems, of the population in those countries are now atheists or not very serious Christians. They don't, really, they don't take religion very seriously. It's just like Christmas, it's supposed to be a religious celebration, but it's almost, among most people, it's forgotten. It's a time for great uh, personal pleasure. You could say Diwali is like that also in India. Here in Tamil Nadu, Pongo. It has some religious basis, but mostly people, they don't take it very religiously, and they, it's just a time to have a good time. So even though in, in Christendom the uh, people have become more or less atheists or they don't care much about religion, but still the idea we just have this one life and we have to, we have to enjoy it because there's no, if they don't believe in God then there's only one life left. And instead of thinking, well, is it really just one life? Why are we here? How do we get here? There are so many questions. Why is someone born in a rich family, someone born in a poor family? Which actually, unless we accept reincarnation, there's, no, there's not any very convincing answer to that. Why someone, why God should put someone in a rich family and someone in a poor family? Why God should, if, if you have to be a Christian, Otherwise, you're doomed to hell forever. Why does God put people in families where they're not Christian? They don't have any exposure to that. that mean, why? 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 That mean he's setting them up to go to hell forever? There's no good answer. But anyway, the idea. Anyway, I'm getting. I was turned out Augustine. He gave these ideas, and they're still going. A very influential figure. So he gave a lot of the philosophy of Christianity, but he adopted it. A lot of it from the what we call the ancient Greeks, although at that time they weren't so ancient. And the, the Greeks, they weren't Christians. They are now, but, uh, but uh, not Catholics. They have their own church, the Greek church. They have their own church. God likes the Greeks. Must be, right? If you're born in Greece, you've got to think, well, maybe he stopped liking them now because their country is in such a mess. <laughs> anyway, uh, Later on, some hundred years later, then Thomas Aquinas came and he was the next one to throw in a bunch of uh, philosophy. And again, a lot of it drawn from the, from the ancient Greeks. So as, as far as any uh, philosophical structure is there, it's, it's most, in Christianity, it's mostly not from Christ. And without understanding that we're not the body... We get body after body, according to our karma. 
what's the use of the philosophy actually? It's philosophically bankrupt. It's, it's meaningless. You, you don't know the ABCs of spiritual knowledge. But anyway, the point is, much of what is taught as Christianity is not coming from Christ. And that's true in Buddhism also. And Buddha himself didn't teach much. It was elaborate philosophical systems were um, made up later. And I guess you could say that in what we call Hinduism also. Shankara, he gave a philosophy, and then Ramanuja gave, but everything they say, that's one symptom of why we accept them as Vedic Acharyas, why we accept even Shankara as a Vedic Acharya, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu called him Acharya, except because every statement they make in their philosophy is backed by Shastra. It's not something. Whereas with Thomas Aquinas, he said, reason is a gift from God, and then phew, he's free to make up anything he likes. As long as it seems reasonable to him. That's a bit of a sweeping statement, but more or less it's correct. <clears throat> Actually, I'm saying all these things. You, you meet your average Christian on the street, they don't have any idea about all these things. They have no idea. We're supposed to be professional preachers or theologians or whatever, so we may know some more things. <clears throat> For them, it's go to the church on Sunday and get your chicken and come home and uh, Believe in God and you go to heaven, and everyone else goes to hell. So you can sit in heaven and watch all your forefathers in hell and enjoy yourself. <laughs> but you know Taco, <laughs> one of his comments about Christianity is as follows, translated from Bengali. I believe it's from Bengali. Not Sanskrit. Thinking about, yeah, this is Bhaktivinoda you know, Thakur and his Tattva Vivek. One of Bhaktivinoda you know, Thakur's words. It was written in uh, the Tattva Sutras were written in Sanskrit. <clears throat> so this is translated. Bhaktivinoda you know, Thakur writes Thinking about the virtues and faults of this world, some moralist monotheists, that's how he refers to. Christians. They're monotheists and they're moralists. Because in India at that time, the Christians, they were very strong. We are very moral. Your Hinduism is not moral. You burn widows. You don't allow, or, or you don't allow them to remarry. And in so many ways they said it was immoral. We are very moral people. You see, we come and take over your country and subjugate it and take away all the wealth and we're very moral. We do it in a very moral way. They wouldn't say that exactly. <laughs> so some moralist monotheists concluded that this material world is not a place of unalloyed pleasures. In other words, they looked at the world and they said, hey, it's a mess. Well, why? Why is it so bad? We believe in God. God is good, why did he make it so bad? That problem is still there in Christianity. Why is there suffering if God is good? So, uh, what's the reason? Of course, we understand that Purusha Sukha Dukkanam Bhutridde Heitur We make our own suffering and enjoyment by our karmic activities. But if you don't believe in karma or reincarnation, then it becomes a uh, difficult point to uh, explain. So this is how they explain it. Indeed, Bhaktivinoda Thakur continues, they have perceived that the sufferings outweigh the pleasures. They decided that the material world is a prison to punish the living entities. Okay. Sounds good. If there is a punishment, then there must be a crime. Hmm. Right, that's logical, right? If there were no crime, then why would there be any punishment? 
What crime did the living entities commit? Why is someone born deaf, dumb and blind? What crime did he commit? Unable to properly answer this question, some men of small intelligence gave birth to a very wild idea. Ah, because, yeah, okay, okay, this is from the beginning of the Old Testament, the story of Adam and Eve. Uh, God created the first man and placed him in a pleasant garden with his wife. Sounds nice. Then God forbade the man to taste the fruit of the tree of knowledge, following the evil counsel of a wicked being. Satan, Shaitan, imparted into Christian ideas from Zoro Zoroastrianism, it seems. And that was in Persia. We still have the Parsis in India. They had the idea of Satan, someone very bad who makes us do bad or tempts us to do evil things. So following the evil counsel of a wicked being, the first man and woman tasted the fruit of the tree of knowledge, thus disobeying God's command. God said, don't eat the fruit of that tree. And they ate it, commonly believed to be an apple. <laughs> In this way, they fell from that garden into the material world filled with suffering. Because of their offense, all other living entities are offenders from the moment of their birth. Not seeing any other way to remove this offense, God himself took birth in a human-like form, took on his own shoulders the sins of his followers, and then died. No other way. And then nothing else to do, except you have to come and take all the sins and then die. All who follow him easily attain liberation, and all who do not follow him fall into an eternal hell. In this way, God assumes a human-like form, punishes himself, and thus liberates the living entities. And Bhakti Nautako's comment, an intelligent person cannot make any sense of this. <laughs> So the Christians, their yeah, whole thing, you have to have faith, you have to believe, believe, you have to believe, right? That's their whole thing, that's their whole theology and orthodoxy and orthopraxy, everything. You have to believe, you have to believe. Bathe yourself in the blood of Jesus. Hmm. <laughs> so that's their whole thing, but in Vaishnavism, Ado Shadha. Faith is the beginning. It's not the end. They, they you have to have faith. You just believe and you'll be delivered. But in Vaishnavism and in actually in all the Dharmic religions, for want of a better word, there, well, all this, the spiritual manifestations we can say, because in karma kanda, no. Karma kanda is based on material enjoyment. But in the jnana kanda, the bhakti marg, and even in Buddhism, although they don't believe there is any such thing as consciousness or really anything, but they're all based on purification of consciousness. That one can become spiritually advanced, one can come close to God by purification of consciousness. But in, in Christianity and Islam and, I, I'm not sure, in Judaism, these three are called the Abrahamic religions. It's just, you believe, that's all. They put emphasis. Of course, there has been in Christianity a, 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 a major philosophical discussion about whether it's enough to believe or you have to do good also. The path of faith and the path of acts. So that's... Uh, that's similar to the Tengalai, Vadegalai divide in Sri Vaishnavism. You just surrender to God once, that's it. You don't have to do anything else. No, no, you have to go on taking shelter. 
you have to, so that becomes the Majara Nyai, the path of the kitten who, who is just uh, taken by the mother cat without any effort on the part of the kitten and the Markata Nyai, the monkey has to, the baby monkey has to hold on to the mother. So it's a similar thing is there. Uh, so uh, Christians, they emphasize very much you have to have faith. You have to have faith that Jesus was born from a virgin. Uh, maybe that's possible nowadays by, the, by an injection. I'm, I'm not sure. Presumably it is. But uh, in those days it was unheard of. Yeah, you can, yeah, you can do it all the time with cows, right? You just give them an injection and they get pregnant. Uh, and you have to believe in that and you have to believe in uh, Jesus died on the cross to redeem us from our sins. So that's the emphasis. Not that you have to purify your consciousness, you have to get free from lust, anger, greed, and all these things. Of course, it's expected that someone who is a good Christian will be moral. But they, again, because actually their teachings are not very advanced, they, uh, they think nothing of eating meat, killing animals. So, for all their kindness, uh, and trying to do good to others, it's all tainted by this uh, bloodiness of killing animals and eating animals unnecessarily. Uh, about Jesus, when he was, it was Srila Prabhupada, but when he would meet Christians, he would almost inevitably bring up the point that you shouldn't kill, thou shalt not kill, taken from the Ten Commandments of Moses. Uh, well, given by Moses, from God. Uh, that, 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 that means you shouldn't kill animals also. Srila Prabhupada would inevitably bring this up, this point up. Then the Christians would say, well, Jesus, he fed people with fish and this and that. And Christ said, well, if you Jesus, sorry, Prabhupada said in this regard that, well, if you're in the desert and there's nothing else to eat, then you can eat meat, but um, otherwise not. But actually there is historical and linguistic analysis which suggests that actually Jesus wasn't a non-vegetarian. He was vegetarian, for that matter. So this idea, you have to believe that God took a human form and died on the cross, it's uh, very much antithetical to the Vedic understanding of the of Brahman being Satchidananda. He's eternal, full of knowledge and bliss. You can't kill him. He doesn't suffer. If he's tied up and killed by others, then how can it be God? It's not, he comes and enacts his leela. His leela is not to be lashed a hundred times and then nailed to a cross. This, Leela means pleasurable activities. So the, the whole concept of suffering uh, is very deeply inherent in Christianity. And many people, they, they like to accept suffering uh, to, is in the imitation of Christ. And that may be there in Vedic culture also, tapasya, but with the idea not to imitate Christ, but to purify one's consciousness, to reduce the, uh, the attachment to material sense enjoyment. And of course, in Krishna consciousness, uh, especially in the modern age under Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, we, we don't stress tapasya. The main thing is to love God. And that's the main thing that uh, Jesus taught, it seems. Yeah, thou shalt love the Lord. Thy God with all thy heart is the first commandment which Jesus upheld. But they don't have information of God. Who is he? It's very, very striking when, when you start coming like myself from a background where this knowledge is not there. When you start to read Srila Prabhupada's books, 
how rich they are in knowledge of God, which you won't find, definitely not in the, in the Christian tradition, very rich in knowledge of God. On one hand, we don't want to criticize, on the other hand, we should see there is a difference. It's also belief in God, but there is a, a great difference. So this idea that Jesus dies on the cross, the cross that's central to Christianity. What, what's the symbol of Christianity? The cross. Right? That's, that's the thing, the cross. That's the central. Uh, once Tamal Krishna Maharaj was, uh, I think he was reading a letter or something, he was, he was conveying some questions to Srila Prabhupada about this. So Tamal Krishna Maharaj said, he says, he's referring to someone else, what is the actual meaning of the sacrifice on the cross? Again, the idea of sacrifice. In Vedic culture, in Jewish culture, they also had sacrifices. You sacrifice a lamb in the temple. So the idea, it, Jesus' death was theologically made into a sacrifice. Just like you kill a lamb in a sacrifice, Jesus was killed as a sacrifice. To, to redeem us from our sins. So Tamal Krishna Maharaj asked Prabhupada to give his a teaching. What is the actual meaning of the sacrifice of the cross? Jesus dying on the cross. Srila Prabhupada said, it has no meaning. That's it. The whole of, the whole of Christianity has no meaning. The people were so rascal that they attempted to kill him. It's another point he made. He was teaching them about God, and at least in India, mostly, people are welcomed if they teach about God. At least that culture is there. But they killed him, or they attempted to kill him, because, why they, because he was speaking of God. So we can understand the pollution of the then society, how intelligent they were, he had to deal with such rascals that he was speaking about God and the result is that they wanted to kill him first. He preached, thou shalt not kill, and they killed him first. That is their intelligence. Tamal Krishnamaraj, the next question he brings up, did Jesus die on the cross to redeem all the sins of the world? Prabhupada answered, that is a, another sinful thought that Jesus has taken a contract for ridding your sinful activities. That's a plea for the sinners that they will continue acting sinfully and Christ will take a contract to counteract it. That is a most sinful conviction. Instead of stopping sinful activities, we have given a contract to Jesus Christ to counteract it. In other words, Jesus died for my sins. I believe in Jesus. He'll rid me of my sins. We're very weak, we can't stop sinning, so we'll go on sinning, and Jesus will deliver us. Tamal Krishna Maharaj said at this point, so these people are not actually getting free of their sins unless they stop sinning. And Prabhupada said, then what is the use of his preaching? In other words, if they're following, if Jesus is actually a competent preacher, then you should take up his preaching and follow what he said. But if they don't do that, then what is the use of his preaching? They will, Srila Prabhupada continue, they will continue sinful activities and Jesus Christ will take a contract for saving them. How nonsense idea this is. Nonsense rascals. These people should be immediately hanged. Brother, he didn't say crucified, hanged. So he was very strong at that point. Of course, in many cases, Srila Prabhupada was appreciative and conciliatory, but if you take what is the essence of their philosophy, it's, it's very wicked actually. That you, instead of taking Jesus' actual teachings, you just take him as a, as a mascot. And we'll go on doing what we like and Jesus will save us and everyone else goes to hell. So, <clears throat> philosophically speaking, we can say that Christianity is <clears throat> not solidly based on Jesus, and really it's bankrupt in as much as they don't have the 
first understanding of the difference between the soul and the body, and no understanding of who God is, and practically they're able to spread by threatening people, bribing people, not by giving them an actual experience of God or a process of purification. Of course, there are people in the Christian tradition who have had some uh, experience of God, but that also can't be very clear unless they know who he is, who Krishna is. <clears throat> so, uh, Christianity is dying in the West. It's not my statement. It's, it's still alive in many ways, but it's definitely uh, whatever is going on in the name of Christianity is def definitely uh, becoming less and less, and so they're switching their attention, especially to India, because uh, <clears throat> India is very liberal in that regard. They let people convert others by whatever. They, 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 they're very open in that regard. We didn't see so many Christian preachers in Saudi Arabia, for that matter. <clears throat> they wouldn't be allowed in the country at all. <clears throat> it's very dangerous in many countries to try to convert people from, especially from Islam, to what they call another religion. But uh, as we distribute Prabhupada's books, we can presume that people who are actually intelligent, there's still some people with some intelligence left in the world, his books are meant, Srila Prabhupada's books are aimed at intelligent people. They, 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 they speak to the intelligence. They don't speak to the emotions. Believe or you will be thrown in hell. That's, a, that's an emotional plea. My response to that when I was about 12 or 13 years old, I thought, I started thinking, well, why, why? And so many people say, ours is the way. Why should I believe this just because I'm born into it? So when people ask questions like that, then you, the, the answers you'll get in Srila Prabhupada's book. So we should go on distributing these books and living the lives of devotees so that people can see that this is actual religion. Christianity, yes, as we can say, belief in God. It's, and if you, if you take what Jesus said, his teachings about uh, compassion and kindness to others, uh, very good teachings, no doubt. Uh, but for scientific knowledge of God, uh, or that which satisfies the uh, intelligence and which gives uh, a path of purification, then by Srila Prabhupada's books and those who uh, exemplify the teachings of those books, who live the preaching then uh, we can hope by the grace of the same God who Jesus worshipped that uh, people will understand that this is religion. This is Others, yes, you can call religion, but whatever Christ taught, that is much better actually explained in the uh, Vedic literature and that is being taught by the followers of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in the present age. So there's a little, little background. Any question about this? Why removed reincarnation? Well, I didn't say it was there. You know the answer. That's why you asked the question. You could have said, is, was it for any other reason? For, you said a political reason. Yeah, there's a history there also. How some 300 years after Christ or something. Like that. 
the Roman Emperor Constantine accepted Christianity as the state religion, but he didn't like reincarnation, which apparently had been taught in Christianity up to that time. So he, he made a deal. Cut this out and we'll accept it. That is the history as we're told. Hare Krishna. All glories to his divine grace, Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna.